everyone. So this morning's lecture is uh, going to be given by Chris uh, from our department. Chris is uh, doing his master's with the box, and part of his research is focusing on batch scheduling. So he's the perfect guy to be giving this talk today. It's just a high-level intro into batch scheduling. And just to point out that even if you work in a company that has mostly continuous operations, there will always be some sort of batch element to it usually around the packaging, or just planning the sequence of uh, product being produced on the same process. Uh, and Chris is going to talk a bit about how it can be done smart and intelligently, though nine times out of 10, you'll find companies using Excel spreadsheets and doing it by trial and error and by intuition. Um, so companies that I've worked in, they have meetings every morning to plan the batch scheduling for that day, and they have 10 people standing around one person packaging, one person for production, one person for raw materials, one person for modeling, and various parts of the company, and they all stand and brainstorm how to plan the schedule. But it's so inefficient, and then they cannot react to changes, they have to call a meeting again to plan changes. So Chris is going to talk about how we can do this smartly and intelligently, and the companies that do this successfully really benefit a lot from the market. So I level overview from Chris, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, it is the topic of master's and PhD's research, but it, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, before he starts, I just want to also mention, on the course website now for several days, it's being posted uh, an SDL uh, rubric for the grading. And so a lot of people have been asking me, should I include this, should I include that in my report? All of those questions are usually answered on the course website already for uh, several days. Most of you have seen it, a few groups haven't. Uh, we'll just take a look at that to um, help clear up any doubts if you have any. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So again, my name is Chris. It's my chance to be here the time. I'm going to be talking about batch scheduling. I've been working with this topic for about the last year and a half or so um, as part of my master's topic. So it's something I'm very excited about. And uh, today, I'm going to share some of my insights with you. Um, Kevin has given a really good overview already about what batch scheduling is and some of the issues that are involved with it. But uh, to really learn a problem, I think you don't learn until you start kind of playing around with it and understanding some of the problems that you have to face and trying to solve. So having said that, let's get your feet wet and let's try to solve this problem right from the get. -go. So the way this process works, it's a batch process, not continuous. So what that means is, for example, over here, we have this heating step, the heater a batch reactor, and you have this, this separation column over there. The, re the heater takes one hour, the batch reactor takes two, and the separation step takes one hour. So you have a batch of material that goes through the first step, the second, and the third. What I'd like you to do, take two minutes in your, in your um, sketchbook and just draw something. Draw a little Gantt chart about what a real schedule might look like for this process for a four hour time horizon. What your answer should look like is something like this over here. You're going to draw a little mini Gantt chart. So off the top, you're going to have the heater, the reactor, and the stick. You have time 1, or 0, 1, up to 4. And I want you to kind of draw a bar from when the task starts to when it ends to show how long it's operating for for a full batch of material. So take two minutes and, and show me what you have. Does everyone kind of have an answer? Are people still working on this? If you have an answer, put up your hand, please. So we have a couple. If you need more time, you have a minute, put up your hand. Everyone's done, more or less? Terrific. Who has an answer that they'd like to share? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, would you like to come from the job? Yeah. Excellent. 
round of applause for a volunteer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's probably chalk right there that you can use. Yeah, you can draw with that. Yep, that's good. Perfect, thank you. So, I would say this is pretty good. How I would have drawn it, typically Gantt charts are drawn with bars. So how I would have done it just a little bit differently, this is a good representation, is I would have done it like this. Sorry, Kevin, I broke your film shot. <laughs> <laughs> So this is how I might have drawn alternatively, but ultimately we got the same answer. Um, what do you guys think about this? Is it a good answer? What if, like, what if you started the heater again at two till three? That way you can continuously run your reactor. Excellent. That's right. So what if I started again over here? A, a new batch over here? Yes, that one. This one over here? Yeah, I could do that. Sure. But the only thing is, let's say it's only four time horizons, right? Then this part is going to stretch outside here. That's true. Right? But. If you're, if you're solving the problem continuously, you're correct. You could have done that. That would have been a better answer. All right, is there anything else someone would like to share? No? All right, so let me ask you this. Is this a good answer? Thoughts? Yeah, it's a good answer. Sure. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, how do we know? What if, well, let me throw in a little bit more. What if over here, the reactor actually broke down and we don't have it available? What happens then? How do we change the schedule? Or what if, for example, um, over here, there's a 15 minute coffee break where nobody is running the operation. Now that's not totally realistic, but all of a sudden it's not that simple. What if there are other considerations to consider? So over here, so we've identified that at the very least, this is a feasible production schedule if everything holds up and everything's perfect. But that's very rarely the case in reality. But you know, like I said, what happens if it breaks down? Now, we haven't even considered mass balances on this thing. What if this can only handle, handle, I don't know, 20 kilograms of material, and this can handle, you know, two, and that can handle five? That becomes a lot more, a lot more difficult. Now you have to consider mass balances. Also, what about product yield? What if you have a series of these? What if you have three reactors, and they're all the same size, but one reactor is better than the other? One tends to foul a little bit more. Now you have different product quality, different product material, different yields. All of a sudden, this very simple problem is not so simple. How do we address issues like that? How do we address the schedule? And then finally, you know, how good of a schedule can we get? How do we, do we, how do we measure good? All these questions that we're going to address in the future, very, very soon. Um, so scheduling is really composed of two things at the highest level. Scheduling is kind of the timing of events. So when do things happen? But in scheduling, you also have to consider the sequencing. Sequencing is the order of when things or how things happen. So precedence relationships. So for example, you can't do the reactor before the heater. That doesn't make sense. And you can't do the still before the heater. You have to do them in this step each time, unless you already have material being stored in each of these things. Now you have to consider storage policies. So there's the scheduling, which is the timing, and the sequencing, which is the order. Typically, when people talk about scheduling, they'll kind of refer to both. But they are technically different, so just be aware of that difference. Um, now, where this fits in with the plant hierarchy is this is kind of uh, a concept from process control. So we have this process control hierarchy. At the highest level, we have supply chain management. This is an active area in, in chemical engineering right now, um, but you probably won't see it unless you go to grad school. And then the supply chain is, you know, how do we ship things globally? Where do we store it in war warehouses? Uh, how much inventory do we carry? What are the minimum costs we can have? Under that, you have production planning, where people will plan out how stuff will be run and inventories for months in advance. On the lower level below that, you have the scheduling, which is what we will be talking about today. And below that, you have advanced control systems, you know, for example, real-time optimization, model predictive control, PI control. Some of these you have seen, and some of them you may not have. These will be covered in some degree in perhaps chemical engineering for GO3 and perhaps at the end of uh, chemical engineering for EO3. But these are advanced topics, so they're not going to be that covered in any of your undergrad material. If you go to grad school, you'll see them a lot more. 
So what is batch scheduling? Let's kind of give it a more of a definition. It's a very important issue in process operations. It deals with the allocation decisions of limited resources over a given time horizon for manufacturing of different products following a batch recipe. Uh, and that's from Mendes et al. Now, I was trying to get earlier at what is a good schedule? How do we measure good? Um, how should we, how, what metrics do we use? These are some of the metrics that are available to us. So for example, you might want to maximize profit for your production process. Another alternative might be, I want to minimize cost. They're not always the same thing, actually. They can be different, and they can give you different answers depending on what you're trying to achieve. The make span, this is an important term in scheduling. The make span is given you want to produce, say, 50 tons of material. What's the minimum amount of time that you can use in order to produce that 50 tons? So, given a fixed production schedule, you want to produce a fixed amount, what's the minimum amount of time to produce? On the other end of things is the maximized throughput. So, given a fixed time horizon, say 20 hours, how, what's the most you can produce? Then over here you have lateness. Typically you want to minimize lateness. Lateness is defined as the difference between completion time and due date. So when do you actually finish producing versus when was it due? And then tardiness is the absolute value of lateness. Typically you, you minimize these in an optimization setting. You might be wondering why this is an important issue to chemical engineers and why we're talking about it today. But the fact is, is that a lot of chemical sites can produce like 5 to 10 million per day. That's just a medium scale production facility. Exxon Chemicals over here reported a 2% and a 2% annual operating cost decrease by using methods such as this and a 20% inventory decrease. DuPont managed to reduce working capital from 160 million to 95 million. What that means is that they had money tied up in their inventory that they weren't using, and now because they have those savings, they can spend that money on other projects and increase NPV, which is stuff you saw earlier in the course. And then finally, the point I'd like to make here is that scheduling is being more and more used as a competitive advantage. So the more increasingly relevant question is, how can I outschedule my competitors? Because if I can outschedule my competitors, I can outperform them, and then I can make more money and have more market share. So at this point, maybe you're wondering, why is batch technology used? You know, is continuous not better? Isn't it more efficient? That's what we've been learning about you know, from most of, the, most of our undergrad. Well, not necessarily. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of batch technology is still used is that the retrofitting from a batch plant to a continuous might have a very, very high capital cost. So switching is not that easy. There are barriers to switching. Um, also, certain industries are very regulated by the government, for example, pharmaceutical industries. They are so regulated that they can't just switch from pharmaceutical to continuous, just like that. They need to get a series of permissions. That would be a huge revolutionary change in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, that's actually a very relevant um, topic right now in chemical engineering research. And there's a professor, Dr. Paul Barton at MIT, who's starting to do research on this. And also another guy, I think, at Purdue named Dr. Replitis. So this is an active area of research, but it's not being implemented yet. But this might be the future. Also, what's nice about batch systems is that you have certain quality control issues. So you have a certain degree of uh, control. So for example, if one batch goes wrong, it's limited just to that one batch and not necessarily at all of them. That way you can avoid spoilage and losing product quality. That makes it very useful, whereas with the continuous, it's going to keep on producing the substandard process, the uh, substandard uh, quality product until you correct whatever's wrong. Another reason is that if, if you're already making a lot of money and your, product, and your profit margin is very high on your product, you may not want to switch to continuous. It may not make sense. What, you, what you're doing right now might be already the best. And then finally, what's really nice about batch technology is that it can be quite flexible. So you might have multiple configurations and all you have to do is transfer how things are, are, are um, gone, doing or being passed through different systems. So for example, let's say you have machine A that goes to machine B and C. If machine B is down, you can get transfer to machine C. And then you can just transfer it and keep on running. That may not be uh, possible with a continuous system because they're so tightly integrated. But that's not in all cases. How do we go about 
scheduling different methods. What can we use? As Kevin alluded to earlier, a lot of companies just use Excel and a lot of experience and intuition. So for example, you might be a processor, I mean um, an operator, who's been doing the job for 25 years. You know that the production schedule always looks like this 24-7 and all you have to do is repeat and it'll work. Um, that's how a lot of people do it and that's how it's done. But that may not be necessarily the best way. In fact, it might be suboptimal or substandard. There may be better ways of doing things and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, a lot of methods are, are heuristical in nature. So for example, like I mentioned, you may have, you may have noticed that over the, your period of working somewhere that a schedule works really well when you do it this way. So we're going to keep on doing it this way forever and ever. And just the final definition on this slide, that cycle time is the average time to produce a batch. So sorry, I didn't catch your name Jeff. Jeff had a great idea earlier. Jeff mentioned that, you know, we can redo this schedule if we just shift it a little bit over here. That's what you said, right? Okay. That's a great idea. Because over here, right now what we have is a non-overlapping schedule. So if I have a non-overlapping schedule, I'll restart it over here. But that's not necessarily the best. I could actually push this entire schedule, right, starting over here, back here and I can get more done in less time. That's a more efficient schedule. So that's the difference between a non-overlapping schedule and if we shift it backwards, we get this overlapping schedule over here. So now I have another example for you guys to try to try solve because you know, now you know a little bit more about that schedule. <coughs> so we have this process here. We have three products being produced, A, B, and C. A goes through the mixer, the reactor, the separator, and the packaging. B goes through just the separator and the packaging. C goes through the reactor, the separator, and the packaging. I'd like you at first uh, to try and get a comp with a schedule for, say, just one, one batch of A. So go ahead and start with it. And then I'll, I'll take it up in two minutes. See you guys So each machine can so you can't have all the products going in at the same time. No, not in this case. It's purely just what's up. But if you guys want to make it more complicated, throw in some cleaning, that would be great too. I just need five hours. Okay. Yeah. So, you have an answer? If you're still working on it, put your hand up. All right, I'll give you guys one there.
All right, does someone have an answer? What's the yes? Ish. Yeah? No? Ish. Ish? Ish? They won't want to send a share their answer or even their ish answer. Mixer, reactor, separator, packaging, and then repeat. And if you're really good, you'll condense them as much as possible. So when you condense them, you want to do two cycles. You end over here at the white bars at the end. You get something like that. Um, having said that, uh, let's try B. So come up with a schedule now for just B. This one should be a little bit easier. And remember, it only goes through the separator and the packaging and not the mixer or the reactor. Everyone about done? All right. Someone else want to have an answer for me? Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. I just like seeing an answer. Anybody? Separate. This could be going all the time, pretty much, and then after that, the packaging. Yep. Sounds good. So let's take a look at what the answer might look like. So here's the answer. Just look at what Jordan suggested. Separator packaging. Repeat. Now try product C. So do you have an answer for C? It's very simple, right? Probably what you expect, give or take. Now that you know that, try all three of them. And we'll actually discuss this next one. So you're going to produce all three products. Or say, one, one batch of all three products. Yeah, Kevin? How can you separate C before reacting it? How can you separate C before reacting it? Sorry. Oh, you're talking over here? Yeah. What that might be is, for example, maybe it's not starting from empty. Maybe that unit was already full, and you're just starting that as the beginning of the so timeline. So you need an assumption. Yeah. 
So, you know, you're not going to always assume that your batch is totally empty and that you're starting from zero. Maybe that you're halfway through a process and now, you know, your process broke down or your schedule broke down. You need a new schedule. There is some material already there. You're halfway through your, your schedule. So what's the new schedule now for the rest of the time horizon? So in this case over here, it may be that there is something already in the separator. So you don't need to start taking a new batch. You just need to finish the one you already started. That was just this case, though. Take down about the ABC. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at ABC. Over here, you see that all of a sudden, considering all three products, this got a lot more complicated very quickly. So over here, we're starting off with producing A, goes through that whole process, then we start producing B and C, and then you have this, mis this mis mismatch of, of stuff happening over here. It gets very complicated. Now, this is not uncommon in a real plant. This is called a multi-product plan. So you're, you're producing several things at the same time, and you have to come up with a good schedule. This isn't easy. This isn't obvious. How do we go about doing a good schedule for something like that? Let me give you a couple more definitions. Actually, let me go back to the previous one. Kevin brought up an excellent idea. Um, he asked me, you know, Chris, is there any, any cleaning in between when you do A and you do B? And I said, in this case, no. But what if there was cleaning in between? Uh, why would you want to clean? Anyway? Prevent product contamination. Yep, that's excellent. So that's something, again, you might see very much in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, actually, I saw something on, like, I don't know, this average, like, 20 minutes, I don't remember. Some documentary about uh, uh, this particular engineer, and uh, she whistle blew on it was a pharmaceutical company. So what the company was doing was that they actually weren't cleaning uh, the, ex or the, uh, I think it was the extruder. Yeah, they weren't cleaning the extruder as they were changing from product to product. Um, and so you're getting drugs that were cross-contaminated. So people taking, you know, ibuprofen or whatever, weren't getting ibuprofen, they're getting something totally different. And, you know, for certain medical conditions, that's really, really dangerous. Um, I can't remember how that turned out. I think she got let go by the company, but I, did, I do think she got um, part of the settlement uh, out of that. So when they were trying to sell over, uh, the company was fine for what they were doing, and she got part of that money. But uh, she went through a lot to do that. But that's that's a very important quality control issue. Let's even go to something simpler. For example, let's say you're producing different colored dyes. If you're producing orange and you're producing green, you definitely have to clean this out before you start the new batch, otherwise you're going to get some other color. So that is, something like that is called a sequence-dependent changeover. So when you're changing from producing one thing to another, you have to do some kind of an intermediate step before you can start doing the new sequence. So over here, like Kevin said, before you, you start producing B, you might need to clean the separator and the or you might need to clean the separator over here. And then, for example, when you're changing from back from B to A, you might need to clean again. So that's something you'll see very common in a lot of scheduling problems. Another changeover is a frequency-dependent changeover. So for example, uh, let's say you use a machine, every time you use a machine three times, you need to either clean it or do some maintenance because it's going to break down. So that's frequency dependent change over. So how often you use it versus a sequence, the order of which you do things. Chris, how do you handle cleaning in your schedule? <coughs> Over here? Yeah, let's say it needed to be cleaned. So if I were doing this for... So yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so if I were doing this as part of my work, that's very commonly done. So for example, this each of these steps over here will be modeled as a task. So that will become an index. Then you would just add an additional task saying, I need uh, a cleaning step. And then you model the constraints saying, uh, after I've done producing <coughs> something and I want to switch to producing something else, I need to start, uh, I need to have that step in between. Um, but usually, if you're doing that in an optimization framework, it makes the optimization one more complicated and two harder to solve. Also, you'll probably need additional binary variables to do something like that. So what I'm, what I'm saying for your benefit is if there was a cleaning step in between, all of a sudden that's something you need to consider. It makes the problem a little bit more complicated, but if you don't have it, you can ruin your entire schedule and you can start ruining product. It's a very important issue. 
That's what I'm trying to get at. But if you're doing an optimization framework, it's, it's been modeled, it exists. Okay. But I guess if you're producing A and then another batch of A after it, you may, then your constraint could be that you don't need it. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? So then you might have something like a big M constraint. It's only uh, active uh, when you're switching, making that switch, that transition. Otherwise, it's slack. Okay. Yep. Sorry, that's just half the round talk. 4G. Yeah, this is, this is stuff you might see in 4G depending on how the course you learn next semester. Let me start with another definition over here. Uh, there's kind of two different topics, or there's two different uh, categories of scheduling kind of. There's a flow shop and a job shop. The flow shop is where all the products go through either the same equipment or they go through the same sequence of tasks. So for example, uh, here's this example of you know making biscuits. Everything has to be first mixed, baked, cooled, and then you add icing. But they all go through the same steps over and over again. For a job shop, a job shop has either different equipment or different steps. So for example, you'll see that A and B go through the exact same steps, but that C does not. Or for example, over here, you'll see that a goes through all this equipment, but B only goes through the separate the packaging. C only goes through here. It doesn't go through the same steps. That's what makes this the job shop. Job shop, that they don't go through all the same steps or the same equipment. Full shop, they do. So some of the intelligent methods that we can do scheduling involve some of these methods up here. So for example, there's constraint programming and metaheuristics. Uh, these are very complicated grab topics, so I'm not going to go into them in too much depth over here, but I would like you to be aware of it. So constraint programming is you kind of have this mathematical formulation that you come up with. You try to solve it, and you try to solve it so that you have a feasible schedule. What that uses is that uses continuous variables, integer variables, and uh, it can be solved kind of like an optimization almost. You guys might not be very familiar with optimization at this point, but again, it's a great course to take next semester, so please enroll still. <laughs> Also, um, another alternative is metaheuristics. Some of the metaheuristics include simulated annealing, genetic algorithm, and, and tab research. Again, these are things you may not be very, uh, very familiar with, but there are methods to solve optimizations. What's nice about them is that they can solve very quickly, typically, but you don't know whether you actually have the best answer. You don't know whether you have an optimal. And so what, what's kind of bad about that is you, know, you might have an answer, but you don't know whether or not you have the best answer. You also don't know how far away from the best that you are. So they don't give a measure on that. That's kind of a drawback. Let's talk about some of the optimization-based methods. Again, I realize you guys probably don't have a very developed optimization back in the background for most of you. But uh, let me introduce a couple topics, or a couple concepts over here. This is kind of what a generic scheduling optimization might look like. What this is saying is that you want to minimize this function over here. C1 and C2, all they are are coefficients. So C1 and C2 might be maybe just 1 and 2 respectively. Whereas X and Y are the variables that you're trying to solve. So over here, Y is an integer and X is continuous. So you, everyone knows what an integer variable is. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to some number. But it's an integer number. And then the constraint for this, it's called an objective function. The constraint is that ax plus by must be less than equal to d. So what that's saying is that some parameter times x plus some parameter times y must be less than equal to another parameter d. So maybe it's 1 times x plus 2 times y is less than equal to 5 or something, as an example. That's all, yeah? Those c and a, are they, are they the same for every single plan, or are we going to choose anything we want? Um, typically, it won't. You won't really choose anything you want. For example, these coefficients might be uh, how long it takes to produce something. So earlier we said, you know, some of them take one, take one hour. Others take two hours. Some take 1.5 hours. That might be your A. That might be your B. Your C might be just, for example, let's say we want to minimize cost. So your C, your C, for, so maybe your X and your Y is a variable saying how much you produce. C1 and C2 might be the cost of producing. So minimize the cost of producing times how much you produce. And maybe this constraint is just saying, I want you to produce this minimum level. So I want, a, I want you to produce, say, 
uh, 50 tons of material at the minimum cost. That might be what this op optimization is saying. Really what this is over here is this is just kind of what the generic <coughs> optimization looks like. This is not a specific problem. This is just when you're talking about these kind of problems, this is the slide that everybody throws up, so of course I do the same. Um, what's nice about these things is that, is that they can be solved to global optimality, so you can get the very best answer if you put it in this mathematical framework. Um, also, if you don't solve up to optimality, you can get a measure of how far away from the best answer you are. So maybe all you need is maybe a 25% you know, improvement in what you're already doing and your bosses will be happy. And you'll get to say, well, I, I got a 25% improvement, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm great. And, and then you get your bonus and everything like that. Um, the problem with this is that they can be very complicated to set up mathematically, they're not that simple. And the other thing is that uh, they can be computationally expensive to solve. So what I mean is that some of these problems can become very, very large, and they can take very, very long to solve in, the, in, in your computer. So a lot of research is being done in how can we solve these things very efficiently, very quickly. Um, it may be that maybe, you know, you, your plant people all get together at like 6.30 in the morning, take 30 minutes to plan out the schedule for the day, and then they try to execute. Now let's say in the middle of the day, you know, uh, 11.30 in the morning, when your units breaks down, and you know, it took them 30 minutes in the morning to actually come up with the schedule. Now I need to schedule very quickly, and I need it in a lot less time than 30 minutes. Maybe I need this optimization to spit out an answer in about five minutes, because I need it right now, right then. Because again, like I said earlier, if we're not producing, we're losing five to 10 million a day. Losing out on 30 minutes of production, that could be huge. So when you do something like that, maybe I need the optimization to solve very quickly. In that case, you need this to solve very quickly, um, and whereas, depending on how you, one, you model it, and two, how <coughs> it is, it can solve either very slowly or very quickly. It depends how you set it up. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. Maybe I'll just give another example of that. Uh, think of your university timetables. That's the problem that the university administration is solving when they set up your timetables. They have a computer system that will take all your courses you're taking. You obviously can't be in two classes at the same time, so that's a constraint. And you have to fill in um, all the, money, the credits that you have to take within a semester. And uh, actually, the university needs this information, and they take several weeks to solve that, that optimization problem. Right, so there's a period of time in the university where we cannot make any changes to the course timetabling while the university solves that optimization. And then they release the, the timetable. And it's, it uses some software, I think from IBM is what they're using, to solve that large scale optimization. Do you know what they're using by chance? Yeah, I've got some idea, but I'm not sure the exact name of the package. It's not CPLS, is it? No, interesting. Yeah, so Kevin made an excellent point. Um, that university times table, that's something I can set up mathematically, actually. I, I've been working on it, I can figure it out. I'll give you guys, I, I promise I'll make 30, so. Preference to Kevin. So what, what does an optimization, that, or what does a scheduling problem that has been solved by optimization look like? That process that you saw very in the very beginning, this one over here with the heat of the reactor and the still, actually I made that problem simpler. That's a very common uh, process that's used in scheduling. It's called the Condili process. And uh, this, was, this was something that was solved in 1992. Um, so actually in this process you have the heater, but you have two reactors and you have the still. The reactors actually perform three different reactions and you can solve two different products, or you can produce two different products. So this is actually more complicated than what you guys were solving in the beginning. And what, what this, one of the solutions might look like is you might have the heater step over here at three different times. Here you produce, say, 52 pounds of material or tons, 32 and then 52 over here. And then over here in the still is how much you finally produce. So you produce 100 uh, tons of material. And uh, the, the the profit that you made was, you know, two seven four four units. Maybe that maybe that's a million, as just an example. Uh, and then you know I was talking about how big do optimizations get. This one's actually quite small. This one is just seventy eight binary variables, so variables that are either zero or one. It has one hundred and sixty seven continuous variables, two hundred and forty seven constraints. It's solved in zero point zero three one computer seconds. This is a very small optimization. This one's not that challenging, actually. But what's interesting about these problems is that 
they have multiple solutions actually that are all equally good. So for example, you have this as an alternative solution over here in the next slide. So over here, it decided to do all the heating step earlier over here, and then it changed up the reactions it's doing. It decided to produce the material earlier and then separate them in between. This might change one based on how much inventor you have in your, um, in your units. This might change based on initial conditions. And sometimes, like I said, there's multiple ways of doing things that are all equally good. And that's, that's kind of a quality of these types of optimizations. They might have multiple answers. And that makes it a little bit complicated to solve the problem. So how big do these things kind of get? Well, some of the binaries and continuous, these numbers can be in the thousands. So you can have thousands of, conti of continuous variables, thousands of constraints, thousands of binaries. These are big, big optimizations. They can take anywhere from probably hours. And also, you can just let your, your computer run for a day, and it's still going. These things can take very long to solve. So like I said, an active area research is how to solve these things quickly and efficiently. Um, some of them are, let's improve the math and the algorithms. Some of them are, let's improve the computer and get better uh, solving methods. And some of them are, you know, uh, so for example, when I was talking about this, this simulated annealing and the taboo search, how do we come up with better methods like that? Uh, a common one that's used to solve these kinds of problems is called branch and bound. Again, this is something you might see in 4G if you're taking next semester. Like I said, you guys are going to take the course. Um, so the difference between this one over here is that over here, I'm considering time to be a continuous variable. So what you'll notice over here is that, yeah, it starts at zero, but it ends at something that looks like almost 2.5 or maybe even 2.6. If I compare that to the previous solution, you'll notice that all of them started at zero, one, two, three. This is because this is where we consider time as a discrete. So you're considering increments of time. Maybe, maybe each increment is one hour or two or 1.5. But you're just considering time zero, one, two, three, four. Whereas over here, we're considering time continuously. Uh, which which do you think is better? Any thoughts? Is the screen better? Continuous? Yeah. No, I think the continuous time is better because it gives you more options. Yep. There's no there's no clear cut answer. It's a trick question actually. Um, and it depends on your on your uh, what you're trying to solve. For example, if you need down to the minute scheduling, and you need to know very precisely when things happen. Continuous might be better. But if you're just scheduling, you know, if you're scheduling for a week and you just need to figure out what happens in a day, why, why go with continuous time? Why not just consider discrete, right? Each day is, is a one time point, and maybe seven days is your scheduling horizon. You don't need continuous. So it depends on what you're trying to solve. It's very problem specific, and uh, there's a lot of debate on which is better. It's not clear. But what you'll notice over here is that it came across with fewer binary variables and more continuous. The significance of that is that typically the more binary variables you have, the longer it takes to solve. So this is actually a smaller optimization than the previous one that you saw, but the constraints make it more, kind of more complicated. So it's more complicated to set up, it's a little bit more complicated to solve. It's not clear which is better. This one by chance got a better answer than the previous two, but that doesn't mean it's superior. It may be, it may not be. It's very problem specific. It's very dependent on who's solving it and who sets it up. Oh, and uh, just one last point over here. That continuous time formulation, the first version of that was done by done by uh, Yerba and Flutis in uh, 1998 at uh, I think it was Imperial College. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. No, I'm, I'm just wondering. Do you take market demand into these like problems? So, like, you know, if a company you know has a right now. Yep. You know, the yeah. schedule just changes entirely. Oh, absolutely, on. absolutely. Yeah. It's very common to say, you know, I don't want to just produce a fixed amount by the end of the time horizon. I want a certain amount by this time. Yeah. And so that becomes, like, due dates become very important. But when am I going to produce by and how much? Yeah. That is, that is, I, I'm not considering this in these, in these examples, but that is a common consideration. I mean, another example of this that is airline shape. Yeah. Airline pricing. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, so Kevin was talking about the uh, airline uh, pricing and, and scheduling. Um, I, when, I was taking, when I was in undergrad, I took a course, uh, Commerce 4 QC3, and the guy teaching that was, yeah, Commerce 4 QC3. And uh, one of the profs there, his name was Mladen Jodisic, he worked for a company where he was actually solving problems like that. 
so what's, what, what softwares do we use, for example, to solve these kind of things? What, what's available in industry? If you want to do the whole optimization thing where you set up the optimization by yourself, you come up with it, you develop it, you want to solve it, you might use what's called the solver, <coughs> Cplex. It solves mixed integer programs. What that means is uh, uh, optimizations where they have continuous variables and discrete variables. And you might code that up in a, in a package like GAMS or AMPL. Again, this is stuff you might be seeing next semester in the if you're taking it. Uh, other commercial software that's available is Aspen Plant Scheduler, <coughs> OSS Scheduler, Vertex, and SAP. Uh, if you've worked in business, SAP is a very, yeah, you have worked with like itself. <laughs> um, SAP is very commonly used in business. It's used for every, any and every kind of business application, supply chain management, scheduling, you name it. Um, what's great is that it does all these things. What's awful is it's very difficult to use, and a lot of people, there's a big learning curve on using it. Unfortunately, it's kind of one of the few softwares that exist of its nature. So you don't have a lot of choice in what you can go to as an alternative. So a lot of people are stuck using this thing, which does a lot of, does a lot of nice features, but it's very difficult to use. Um, the way I'm doing my sketching is I'm using C++ and it. And I have four minutes left. So just to give you an idea of where these things are used, there's a university, Carnegie Mellon in the US. They have a lot of professors, or they have some of the best professors, Dr. Grossman in particular, who do scheduling and mixed integer programming. And some of the projects that they've done with companies and implemented are with ADB. So they're kind of a, they're kind of a vendor. They develop a lot of uh, process control softwares and a lot of other types of stuff. Uh, Brascom, Dow, Exxon Mobil over here, PBG, Praxair, Total, uh, Unilever. Here you can see that they're scheduling crude oil operations, uh, capacity planning of power intensive networks, planning and scheduling for gas production, again, oil and gas over here, uh, optimization of bilinear GDP models, simultaneous scheduling dynamic optimization. So these things are used in practice. And this is an active area of research. This stuff is not just high level, you know, it's nice research. It's actually used. If I break them up by industry, you'll see that several of these companies over here are in petroleum. So <coughs> BP, Equal Petrol, Nova, Exxon, uh, we have vendors and consulting, we have ABB and uh, Honeywell, Polymers and Chemical Manufacturing, Dow, DuPont, Raskin, Air Separation, Praxer, Liquid, Consumer Goods, Unilever, and Glass Manufacturing for PPG. I'll give you a short history lesson. I put this at the end specifically because I knew you guys would be very interested in history. Um, so again, you know, you might not have known the Gantt chart, but I figured you guys probably would. It was invented by Henry Gantt in 1910, and what you do is you, the tasks you need to perform to complete a project, you put them on the left side, left side hand over here, you put a bar saying how long it takes, just like we did over there. And that's just been kind of the, uh, the bar for forever. <coughs> Everyone uses it everywhere. Um, another one is the critical path method that you might have seen in Commerce for QC or for, for QA3 if you're in management. Um, so you know what, what you do with the the, uh, state or the, um, the critical path method is milestones. So for example, those tasks that you need to perform will be represented with like a circle or uh, alternatively as an arrow. You'll draw it out and it might look something like this. <coughs> so for example, first you have to work for a milestone one or task one, then two, three, four, five. But before you do three, you have to complete both one and two. Before you do four, you have to complete two and three. And this is just an, a generic example. They might not all look like this exactly. Now, the one I'm showing you over here is the area on node configuration. So there's an alternative one where these milestones are actually put on the arrows as an alternative, just kind of as an FYI. And those can be solved actually as a mini max problem. Yeah. Isn't the arrow intuitive forward down? Uh, technically, but this is just an example. It could be. It may be actually that, you know, um, you're actually limited by both. But that's, that's not unrealistic. You can't see stuff like that. Yep. That's a minute left. Uh, so again, in chemical engineering, we'll refer to them as processing units that perform tasks. Whereas in uh, kind of the business side of things, you'll see them referred to as machines where they perform jobs. This is just the difference in terminology. Uh, the state task, network, state task network 
was developed by Convenient in 1992, which is the problem that we solved at the very beginning and that I showed you some of the optimizations for. And what it looks like is like this. So that process that you were solving, this is actually what it looks like when we look at a state task network. So the states are the feeds, and these represent materials. So first you have feed A that is heated over here and then turns into a hot A. It goes into one of the reactions, and then after you're finished all that, it comes out as a product, and then you have to produce all of this as well. This was a pretty big um, innovation, and uh, it continues to be pretty big today. It's, it's influenced chemical engineering theory. The present day, I use it, a lot of people use it. Um, I'll just wrap up with quick. And then the last slide, uh, in 2005, Grossman, Dr. Grossman at Carnegie Mellon, mentioned that you know this is a big field of topic for chemical engineers. It's kind of like an interface between business and chemical engineering. And so chemical engineers are going to have an increasing role in the future in scheduling and this kind of research and implementing this in real world solutions. Uh, having said that, thank you for your time. Have a great day, guys. And we'll have to <laughs>